Hi, and welcome everyone to our series, Hacking COVID-19, co-hosted by the Biohacking Village, Dime Society, and Med Eisel. Today, we are welcoming Diva Bhaktuni, Sh- Sri Krishna. Hi, Sri. Hi. Hi. So, really quick, can you give us a bit of a bio about yourself? Sure, sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah. As we, I've been uh, working on uh, control of infectious disease for uh, several years now, since the Ebola epidemic in 2014, and uh, subsequently during the Zika epidemic in 2016, and now uh, uh, completely, uh, um, you know, somewhat. Uh, 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 we although we anticipated something like this might happen, we didn't expect it to happen so quickly. Uh, or just you know, within the last three months, the whole world was kind of changed, and so they're now now we're working on the COVID nineteen epidemic, uh, and and part of this is uh, building on work we started there in Ebola. Uh, we were uh, much like today, uh, the, the, there was a lot of confusion and uh, um, panic around what to do about uh, Ebola in twenty fourteen, and uh, so we we started looking. The CDC was uh, all sim- was was just as you know. Um, uh, couldn't couldn't figure out how exactly how to control it, uh, and so we we wrote some papers that got published in the Lancet, and then uh, President of Guinea invited my co-author, who is listed here, uh, Ron Dillon, to, uh, to come advise him uh, in in their national strategy, uh, and we, we basically ended up advising the president's office uh, based on our paper. We advised them to how to control Ebola in their country of 10 million people, and that really uh, set us on a course of. Uh, uh, seeing how uh, unprepared we are for uh, something like what's happening today. Uh, and, and so we were seeing a lot of this happen during the Zika epidemic, and then subsequently now a lot of it played out, unfortunately, uh, in the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, and, and so, but yeah, so we've been working on this uh, for several years. Uh, my private, 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 prior to this, my background is in technology. I built a company called Tropos Networks, which is a uh, Wi-Fi networking company uh, that does uh, Wi-Fi across uh, our cities, metro, metropolitan areas, mm-hmm. uh, and, and outdoor Wi-Fi. It's used in about a thousand uh, uh, customers around the world, thousand cities, and uh, some ut- utilities, and uh, and a bunch of different applications. Uh, and my my technical background is in electrical engineering, computer science. Uh, I have a master's from MIT in uh, mathematics. Uh, prior to that. So what you're saying is that you're really, really, really embracing all the math and all the statistics behind everything that you're about to talk about. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, that's 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 really what my my core is uh, is I guess mathematics, and so uh, I look. That's partly why I guess I was pulled into this uh, in, uh, in 2014. I, I had I, I tried to avoid uh, uh, anything related to biology for many years, uh, and then uh, when when this thing when Ebola hit, uh, it was like a you know. It was like a slow motion atomic bomb that was unfolding. Yeah. And and so I, you know, we, we started to analyze it and look at it, and really, that's when my co-author was a public health expert uh, at Harvard. Uh, he uh, he uh, uh, we, he and I met at a conference, and we started brainstorming on this, and together we collaborated on on, on the research, and uh, and then later pulled in uh, Gerardo Chol, who's also an author and a co-author on this. Uh, and he, uh, uh, I, I, could, I, I was uh, sort of uh, saw him quoted in the press uh, about Ebola, and so I said, "Hey, can we do some modeling uh, to uh, answer some of the questions about testing uh, mm-hmm. for Ebola, uh, rapid testing?" And then that led to the collaboration that we've, we've since then published multiple papers on uh, various aspects of uh, infection control. Okay. And then most so, recently. Mm-hmm. Most recently, this one, right? This is this is coming out soon. This is not yeah. directly published as of yet. So this is a sneak right. preview. This is the preprint. This is the preprint. Yeah. Perfect. I love all of that. Okay. So I'm going to let you talk about this. Your modeling paper on social distancing and how we can move on to a more sustainable way of living. That's right. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, you know, I think we are uh, collectively the whole world is uh, has been stunned by this this virus, and uh, uh, we've really had uh, we didn't really have any good way of dealing with it um, uh, other than just shutting down the economy. Uh, and I think there are some countries that have dealt with it very effectively, uh, notably South Korea, uh, uh, Taiwan. Uh, they they've really kind of led the way in terms of how to rapidly respond to the in- infections. 
uh, and, and, and shut down the transmission between uh, so they really took a proactive approach. Uh, rest of the world, I think, has been struggling to keep up with the transmission rate. Uh, and, and one of the things that um, uh, that we've been trying, you know, so speed is almost speed is everything in, in this in this game. Uh, how you can control the epidemic and and, and its speed of action, speed of uh, adoption of testing, speed of behavior change, speed of everything. Uh, and, and so we've been looking at, you know, because we weren't able to act fast enough, we didn't have the testing in place and we didn't have all the other measures, we had to uh, uh, use uh, uh, social distancing as a kind of like a hammer to cut down transmission uh, between, uh, especially no knowing that this is respiratory transmission, uh, you know, with large groups and large uh, large scale uh, events can, can trigger uh, a, lo a lot of people getting infected. Uh, uh, you know, I think one one striking example of this is there was a study in there was a case study in uh, Washington State where um, uh, 60 people met for a choir practice uh, on a Sunday or you know uh, whatever they usually meet, meet together uh, and uh, and this is a, this is an article published in the, in the LA Times uh, so 60 people met and they um, uh, they, they they met for two and a half hours, and at this, the, at this point, they knew that they shouldn't be, uh, you know, they should be distancing a little bit, not touching or shaking hands, or they avoided all the usual hugs and uh, and so on. But they ended up uh, uh, three weeks later, ended up with 75% uh, of the people in that practice were infected, and two died. Uh, and wow. So, and, and this was such a striking example that the public health agencies kind of realized that you know, this must have been through respiratory pathways and really couldn't have been through uh, contact. Uh, and, and it was and, and it's an example of a, a super spreading event uh, where a large number of people can get uh, infected. Uh, and, and there's a lot of literature on super spreading, which I, you know, we're still trying to assemble and figure out how much of that is going on with COVID-19. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, this is a very transmissible virus in some situations. Uh, and, and that, uh, has led us to kind of say so we've done a lot of work on rapid testing before and then to let this that this paper is about uh, uh, you know if we so that's why that's part of mo what motivates the social distancing is that things like that can happen and happen quickly uh, and so how do you cut down the transmission so that they don't uh, spread like wildfire uh, but now we need to move past that and we need to get to a, uh, a sustainable way of living without uh, uh, relying on, on on this kind of a uh, this hammer, uh, which is, just eliminates all economic activity, uh, and, and you know ultimately will cause health problems for people uh, if, if we don't, uh, uh, you know, have return to some some level of normal uh, activity, uh, and 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 so this is how to do that. And I think one of the um, uh, unique aspects of this uh, um, this epidemic is that the the asymptomatic transmission. Uh, there's a lot of transmission by um, uh, people are getting infected without even knowing they're so the, the people can be infected without knowing it uh, and without any symptoms and they may be transmitting uh, the virus to others uh, and that's what they believe happened in this Washington uh, example it may be happening all over the place uh, and so this uh, it motivates that you know that we need to have some level of uh, uh, so one one of the interventions that we looked at in this paper uh, is, in this in this preprint is uh, how much uh, can face masks help uh, uh, control the epidemic along with testing, because we know that testing is useful to uh, control the epidemic to to reduce. Uh, so the way testing helps is that one, it it helps the person who is infected because their treat their treatment course can uh, can be affected by that. But the other, it also helps the uh, uh, it also helps reduce their likelihood that they're going to transmit to someone else because once they know that they're positive, uh, they can take steps to uh, prevent them from infecting other people. Uh, and so that's one way of actually controlling uh, an epidemic is testing. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, asymptomatic transmission, meaning that people are, don't even have symptoms, they, they're probably not going to get tested. Uh, and so then, how do you uh, how do you control transmission of people that, are, that don't even know they're infected or have any hint that they're infected? And and it looks like face masks could be one of the answers to that question. Uh, and so we wanted to consider that you know we don't have unlimited number of tests we don't have unlimited number of face masks uh, we may have inconsistent use of face masks we some people may get tested some people not so how much face mask use and how much testing 
need to be need to actually happen in order to control uh, COVID-19 uh, and bring it down to uh, uh, so that the cases don't grow exponentially like they are. Uh, and, and the way we describe exponential growth is by a parameter called R, which you may have heard of, uh, uh, you know, R naught or R R zero. Talked about uh, um, for those uh, those in the field are it's very very uh, familiar with, but uh, not everyone may know know what that means. Uh, and it it's a it's basically the exponential growth factor for uh, for the cases. So how how many cases lead to so for each person who's infected, on average, how many other people do they infect? Uh, and that is estimated to be around between two and three for this epidemic. Uh, there's some higher estimates in, in some situations and lower estimates in other situations. And it depends on the situation. Like for example, in that case study of Washington, it was uh, potentially uh, 45 people may have been infected by just one person. We don't know. Uh, but uh, it generally on average, how many people get infected? And that number is around uh, somewhere between two and three. Uh, and so if you, so the question we were asking is, all right, so what if we combined, what if some people wore masks and some people got tested, who, some people with symptoms got tested, how many, how much would they have to be, uh, how much would that have to be in order to bring the R below one? And the, the magic of R below one is that if R is less than one, that means each infected person is infecting less than one person on average. Then eventually the epidemic will, um, will uh, contract uh, and there will be fewer cases than there were before, and that's that's a good thing because that means that fewer people, fewer, uh, people, uh, ideally we have no, no no one's infecting anybody else, like R is zero, but we know that that's not theoretically, that's not, uh, that's theoretically desirable, but not practically achievable. So we wanna see how do we bring R below, sufficiently below one that it actually uh, affects the, uh, it controls the epidemic. Uh, any Any questions, Nina, before I get started and get into the more technical details of the paper? No, so today there was a conference between the governors of a couple of the, the larger hit states. So I'm from New York and I, I watch the Andrew Cuomo updates every day. And one of the things that they talked about was how to coordinate between the, the congruent states to get N down to zero or at least ah. start moving into a better place. So everything you're saying is gold to me right now. Please continue. Sure, sure. Yes, this is the biggest question right now. What do we do? Uh, and I think this is the uh, uh, so Gerardo is actually uh, a uh, one of my co-authors here is a, a one of the world's leading experts on on modeling of uh, infectious diseases. He's re recently written uh, uh, what, what he actually analyzed his group analyzed the uh, Diamond Princess uh, ship and and measured the asymptomatic transmission on that. And then it's been wow. published on many different infectious diseases like SARS and Ebola and and so on. And so uh, and he, he was quoted in Stat News about this, which I think I sent you about our, our preprint. Uh, and so that's where we kind of got a little bit of a, of a color on this. And uh, But more generally, um, one of the uh, things that George Gao said, he's the director of the Chinese CDC. Uh, and he, he said, you know, one of the mistakes that the West is making uh, is that is not recommending use of face masks. And this was uh, right before the CDC changed its mind. Our CDC changed his mind, uh, right. and uh, uh, and that was um, uh, and I think it was a, a, a an idea whose time has come, which is that we do need to use face masks until and unless we have a treatment or a vaccine for this. Uh, we have to find other ways of controlling respiratory transmission because that's the main path by which COVID nineteen is spreading. Uh, and, and so that uh, uh, so how we bring R below one uh, means that how do we reduce the rate of transmission is is really the critical question. So the, the model we use, uh, these are these are it's called a compartmental model, uh, SER EIR type model. It's a very well established modeling methodology in, in, in this field. Uh, and just to give you a technical sense for what it looks like, uh, I'm going to go down to the appendix. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of differential equations and various different uh, techniques. But the basic idea is that there are uh, it models the um, uh, transmission as pe it takes people in a population and then classifies them into different states. Uh, it's a state, uh, uh, like a Markov model or a state-based model, where um, the S is the susceptible population, which is most people, uh, mm -hmm. and S is then uh, some fraction of people get infected 
uh, based on the, what, what, the rate of that people are in other states. And so initially you start with some amount of infection, infection and they become uh, infected. That's E1. Uh, and they can be infected, but they're, it's latent infection. It's not necessarily uh, very infectious at that point. Uh, and then it becomes, an, in, in, so when, when, when you first get infected with COVID, uh, there may be several days in which you're, you're not necessarily infectious. Uh, and then you become infectious, E2, uh, where uh, you, you can then be, start uh, um, infecting others at a certain rate. Uh, and then, it, the, uh, then in this model, We've modeled that you could people. Some people become symptomatic, uh, where they actually show symptoms, and some people become asymptomatic, uh, and that's where the a uh, the a compartments are. And so some of them can be wearing masks. Some of them can be uh, tested. So the symptomatic in our model, we were looking at people who are uh, symptomatically uh, only the people who have symptoms end up getting tested, uh, and whereas every uh, everyone. Uh, some fraction of everyone was wearing uh, is wearing masks, uh, and, and so this uh, and and our question was what fraction need to be wearing masks and what fraction need to be uh, tested for the and, and how fast do they need to be tested? So these are all the the, the the questions we were trying to answer using a model like this, uh, and so the details are all in here, uh, and this is the the result is in, in the graph uh, shown in uh, figure one, I believe, uh, figure, let's see, whatever, the, there's only one figure here, uh, figure 1A. Uh, and this idea, this graph, to explain the graph, it is showing what fraction, so j just to make this concrete, uh, going back to the model, you can imagine um, this compartment uh, um, S to be like the population of New York City. Uh, or mm -hmm. New York metro area, uh, and then each of them would be transitioning between these states, uh, and then the as people move between state to state, uh, not not from 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 each of these boxes, that uh, they have a chance of infecting someone else, and so then that that triggers the uh, so as in, when you're in the I N state, which is the infectious uh, state, you, there's a chance that you're you're, you're that someone in the sep, you're you're infecting someone else in the S, and they move to E one. So it's it's this feedback uh, loop that this in this model, uh, and that should, that that determines the dynamics of the uh, um, uh, of the outcome. Uh, and this is a um, so this graph is telling us the trade-off between uh, uh, so if if the, the symptomatic individuals are tested and isolated uh, versus the total number of infections for different levels of social protection. And the way we define social protection is how effective the intervent, the protection intervention, in this case, you know, for example, masks and hand washing would be in cutting down the rate of spread. So we modeled it for no social protection, for 20% social protection, 40s, 50, 60, uh, and 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 the graphs are showing the how many people in the in in, in the metro area would get infected. Uh, and this, as, as you can see, the more so the, as you increase the amount of people who are tested. On the x-axis, uh, and isolated, they, um, they, uh, the number of people get, who get infected also drops. So uh, that's that's a good thing, right? Because the more people get tested, the reason why that happens is that when someone is tested uh, at, at a drive-through or at a hospital, and they suddenly and and, and they're positive, then you know that they then they can take a, take steps to isolate themselves from uh, other people at work or in their in their school or in their family. Uh, and then get uh, um, uh, prevent the next uh, the next infection, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that or they may go to the hospital and, and be hospitalized and still be isolated. Uh, and so that that isolate that that measure is what's shown on the on the x-axis, uh, and that's why the number of infections goes down as the number of people tested goes up, number of symptomatic people tested goes up. Uh, and if you look at the um, uh, uh, the uh, level of social protection. What that also shows the graph that each line is going down further and further as more as the social protection becomes more and more effective. And the re and that intuitively could, because as more as 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 social protection is cutting down the transmission, you're also going to see you're going to have to test fewer people, fewer of the symptomatic people. And the reason why this has some very immediate implications is that the combination of social protection and testing is, is quite, is, what this is showing is that the combination is really powerful. 
because we know we can't test everyone right now. We're having a lot of trouble. You know, uh, we, we've been the, the frankly, I, I give credit to the uh, U.S. government for 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 increasing the amount of testing beyond any level that we've ever seen before in this country. Uh, and and so the month of March, the, the so the, just to give you some historical context, uh, during the Zika epidemic, um, there was another Zika was another asymptomatic. Uh, disease, which transmits from person to person, uh, but it only ended up affecting, uh, uh, practically affecting uh, um, uh, the, the people who had the most severe uh, impact in Zika were, were uh, unborn children uh, who, who's, who, who got brain damage. Uh, and they, uh, for most other people, it was a mild infection. Maybe it showed up as a skin, uh, uh, temporary sk uh, skin issue, uh, which of course it's significant, but not as, as long lasting. Uh, and 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 so this this is a disease that transmitted all throughout the population, but it only, that ended up you know affecting a small portion. Uh, and at the time, so pregnant women were very much uh, concerned about getting tested, uh, and they um, uh, they were unable to most many of them in Florida, for example, were unable to get uh, uh, get access to tests, uh, and this was a, a big problem even back then. And it was very much related to some of the pro from the reasons why we weren't able to get testing ramped up in January and February. Uh, but of course, in March, a lot of that that took a, our testing took a quantum leap, uh, going from uh, in terms of testing uh, levels, uh, thanks to a lot of the uh, the efforts that they made, the task force did made to uh, to change that with bringing in uh, high speed, high high throughput testing. And so now we're testing. Uh, um, we went from testing, you know, tens or hundreds of people per day uh, for COVID-19 to uh, hundreds of thousands of people per day, uh, and that's mm -hmm. growing. Uh, and that, so that, but still, it's it doesn't it it our true need is still much more. Uh, we need to test a lot more symptomatic people to give you a sense. Uh, um, there's about 34 or five million, uh, 34 million people who are estimated to have influenza, which is has symptoms very much similar to COVID-19 right now. Uh, mm -hmm. And they they might be you know that over a six month period if you divide 34 million divided by six months that ends up being around a couple hundred thousand 200, 250,000 people per day. Uh, so even just to test the people with influenza symptoms, you would need hundreds of, a couple hundred thousand tests uh, per day, and we're only still at about 120,000 uh, or 130,000. So we're we're not able to test 100% of all the symptomatic people who need to be tested, and that's why. This is estimating well if you can if you can be less than perfect how how much how how good enough, what is good enough uh, and then what this is also saying is that the number of people you have to test actually drops if you have better and better social protection so if masks can compensate for for this uh, if you can have good ma you know masks that are more effective versus less effective you can uh, or more people adopt masks you can actually bend the curve uh, uh, in, in this way and that's what the second graph is doing is showing that, uh, the, the, so the, this um, first graph is looking at how do I bring R, R less than one. The second graph is saying, all right, even if I can't bring R less than one, what can I do to bring R less than, so R being, if it's originally 2.4, uh, you can actually still bend the curve to R less than, to 1.6 even. Uh, if you add just 20% social effective uh, social protection and 25% uh, of people tested, so that's a pretty low bar. Uh, if you can bring 20% um, effectiveness of social protection and 75% of the symptomatics tested, you can bring R less than uh, uh, less than one, which would essentially flatten the curve completely. Uh, and this this curve is the daily incidence of, of cases. Uh, and so yeah, so there's a lot you can do by do by even if you had, if everybody can't get tested and everybody's not wearing masks, there's still uh, we, we can still uh, we have a lot of room to uh, end the epidemic. Uh, and so that's what this paper is all about. And in the in the in the appendix, we further have some more analysis on this, where we looked at uh, uh, different assumptions around R. And uh, um, uh, so this is a uh, this was kind of the uh, would give us the insight on this was this is a graph looking at um, on the uh, 3D graph, looking at testing, uh, the percentage of, P of uh, symptomatic testing, the percentage of pr protection, and then what would be the R for each of those cases. And this is using um, uh, 
different assumptions around how fast the testing is uh, and how much how much asymptomatic transmission. So in this mo in this particular model, there's 20% of the people are of the infected people are asymptomatic, and there's a 12 12 hour turnaround testing. Uh, and we vary those numbers in this. And the, the but the interesting part about this is that there's always a continuous trade off between social protection and uh, uh, people who need to be tested and isolated. Uh, and so that that's the um, that curve is what we're showing here uh, in 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 this graph uh, in summary. In the, in, and that's what the main result is. So I so, uh, I'd love to hear some questions or any any thoughts. You I have, have on, questions. You know. This is uh -huh. this, I would. So as a as a science nerd, I love mm -hmm. scientific graphs and figures. Mm -hmm. But my questions are these. Um, so when does this come out? When does this paper come out? So this is uh, uh, it's still in uh, uh, peer review right now. Uh, okay. So it's we don't have a date. Uh, the journals are all pretty much backlogged uh, uh, right. beyond belief right now. It's uh, mm -hmm. probably the biggest healthcare crisis in my lifetime. Uh, right. and, and so, uh, yeah, so we, we, we can't give you a date for when it's going to be published, but this is effectively like it's come out in the sense that it's, pre, it's a preprint uh, on the site Med Archive. It's not been peer reviewed, but it's been, uh, uh, it's available for, you know, for open, uh, you know, obviously all the details are in here. It can be reproduced. And... Okay. So my questions are these from, from some of the news that I was watching this morning. Less than one percent of the entire U.S. population has been tested, and mm -hmm. if we if we rely on social protection rather than than um, adding testing in there, um, mm -hmm. this is as you said, this is all very unprecedented. We're all we're all figuring this out as we go. So, what would be the best way to coordinate all of this? If you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I certainly do. I think uh, um, it seems like a very uh, Thing. We, we just started wearing masks, uh, you know, or at least been recommended to wear masks, cloth masks. There are, are you know, as, as you get back to the original example of that super spreading uh, um, uh, example in, in, uh, in Washington state, uh, if, if those people were wearing, if, if, if so, even some fraction of those people were wearing masks, there's a, there's a much higher likelihood that that wouldn't have happened. Uh, you know, the, the, and, and if they're wearing the right kind of masks. So some, some kind of masks are, mm -hmm. Effective, some are not. Uh, you know, like there's a layer of cloth may not be that effective, but multiple layers of cloth is more effective. Uh, and the, even uh, having specific kinds of materials like activated carbon or uh, N95 even is the most considered the gold standard. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, having something that will that there, the the virus transmits in in uh, large droplets as well as fine droplets. Some uh, mm -hmm above one micron and below one micron. And so the better the mask is at cutting off all those droplets, the more effective it's gonna be. So if someone ends up having a, a lot of virus coming out of their, out of their uh, exhaling a lot of virus, uh, then the mask, it's gonna matter how good that mask is. So the, the more people who can be wearing masks and the better those masks are, the more social protection we're gonna have. Is what the lesson is here, and and if if we can cut down the, even cutting it down by by half will will reduce the how many people need to be tested, uh, and, and and to your point, uh, testing is a, uh, is very much constrained right now, and it's, it will be constrained for some time. When we say we've tested less than one percent, uh, you know, and that's still a lot of people uh, in aggregate, but it's a, as a percentage wise, it's a very small percentage of the symptomatic population. In fact, there have been limiting testing to mostly hospitalized patients. They're starting to expand it in some counties to people who are symptomatic, but not yet hospitalized or not, not needing to be hospitalized. Uh, and then we wanna, there's a, then after that we will, if we have any left over, we can test for people who are close contacts of the, people who tested positive. So family members and work coworkers and, and so on. And so those are the kinds of things we can do as we have more and more capacity. Uh, but we write for the foreseeable future, uh, next month, two, three, we're, we have a limited number of tests. Right, right. So following up on that, so your paper provides a lot of evidence-based information. How do we ensure public confidence in this and saying we can socially protect each other from further furthering this virus? 
so sorry, is your question about what measures we should take, or is it about this paper, the data in this paper, or what? what, what, what? So you've provided all of this evidence for mm -hmm. more folks to wear the mask. Yes. So with this, mm -hmm. how do you want other folks to share this information to say, no, we actually do need to wear masks. Masks are, are, are super important. For example, where I currently live, um, mm -hmm. I went for a walk yesterday and I would, as a percentage, I would say between 80 and 90% of the people that I saw were not wearing mm -hmm. masks. I yes. don't know if they just didn't think it was important or if they just didn't have any. Um, so how do we promote everything that's in this paper? Mm -hmm. by telling them, no, you, you need to wear a mask. It's to socially protect you, it's to socially protect me. Yeah, ex excellent question. Uh, I think that's the discussion we'd love to have right now because uh, that's, I think that's what the inside of this is, uh, is that you, you need, um, ma it becomes more and more important the closer we are together. Uh, so if we're maintaining six feet away, then it's, uh, it's one thing, but if we're, if we're sitting in a room having dinner uh, mm -hmm. or, or uh, chatting, it's even more important. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, talking and, and singing actually increases the amount of, there's a study in nature uh, where they found that talking and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, singing actually increases the amount of part, respiratory particles and viral emissions uh, that a person mm -hmm. has. So interacting actually is more, and time spent actually matters a lot more. So having a mask in those contexts, uh, when you go to the grocery store, or when you uh, are in the office, or when you're... Uh, at a, do a doctor's office even, uh, will make a uh, substantial impact on, on our ability to, uh, and so yes, interacting in public, maybe that's one way that we can return to, to a more closer to normal uh, uh, type of lifestyle uh, is by preventing respiratory transmission through a mask. And, and this is also a call to uh, designers and product designers because mm -hmm. uh, we we all can't wear these the N95 mask is like the gold standard but it's really uncomfortable to wear in a long period yeah. of time uh, and so what how do we make something that we can live with uh, on a daily basis uh, there are some of these uh, athletic uh, masks that I've seen like from base camp and, and uh, a few other models uh, that have replaceable uh, filters uh, so we need something that's that's ergonomic, easy to use, re re reusable, doesn't you know, and, and has a supply that's manufacturable. So like right now, a lot of the, there's a huge constraint on the masks that are for, the, the CDC is reluctant to re to recommend uh, the N95 mask for for consumers because there aren't enough of them for the healthcare workers, and so they're they're right. they're holding back on recommending it for everyone. Uh, but that's not a that's not a technical reason. That's a that's a supply reason. Uh, the supply chain, perfect. Supply chain issue. So if we had our choice, if we had enough of supplies for everybody, we would all be wearing the best kind of mask. Uh, right. and, and so what are the materials that we could use that make it possible for everybody to have that protection? Uh, I'd, that's a really fundamental question that, that also needs to be answered. Uh, and that's up to the material scientists and to the uh, product designers and the people with the knowledge who can do that. Uh, and so one of the ideas that came out was um, that the inventor of the N95 mask uh, said that there's some material called non-woven fabrics, uh, which I don't know much about, but it's intriguing that there's some kind of fabric that may emulate or be, get close to the N95 mask. Uh, and, and this may be more, can be scalable and more manufacturable. Uh, and, and there's, uh, so we need innovation uh, in, in masks. Uh, that and, and innovation in the sense that you know something that that people can wear like just like everyone has an iPhone everyone needs to have a ma you know a different or everyone has an Android uh, we need we all need uh, uh, personal masks that uh, uh, that can be uh, um, worn on a daily basis. Sri, uh, so, thank you so much yeah. for all of the knowledge <laughs> that you have given. I am a big fan of data, and this is just this is this is all the things that my brain needed today honestly and thank you for the call to action because i think that's really important we can't have the mask necessarily that we need but we need to make another mask that gives us all of the same um protection or better and maybe yes. that's something else that we need to work on for the future so yes thank you so much is there a way that you prefer people to get in contact with you uh yeah i guess my email is probably in here i think yeah Here's my email. It's all the way at the top. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. 
All right, perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank Thanks you for so the opportunity. Much. Yes. Yeah.